In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he put this question to his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say he is John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, he said, who do you say I am? Then Simon Peter spoke up, You are the Christ, he said, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are a happy man, because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So I now say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the underworld can never hold out against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be considered bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be considered loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples strict orders not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God's family, dear brothers and sisters, this question of Jesus, who do you say that I am? 2,000 years ago, St. Peter answered it on our behalf, on behalf of the disciples of that time. But that question is addressed not just to St. Peter, to each one of us personally. All of us must give an answer to the question, who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus Christ for me? Who is Jesus Christ for me? The readings of today can assist us to give the right answer and also to grow in our understanding of who Jesus is. Let us look at the first reading that we listened to from Prophet Isaiah. Some 700 years before Jesus was born, Jerusalem was threatened by a powerful army, the Assyrians. King Hezekiah consulted the prophet Isaiah asked what to do in such situation and the prophet's reply was, let him not fear. Yahweh would save Jerusalem, let him not fear. Shebna, the chief commander, the administrator of the palace, palace was a proud man. To impress the people of his wealth and power, he was carving for himself a very rich mausoleum opposite Jerusalem. Added to his pride, he seems to have advised the king against the message given by the prophet in Yahweh's name, telling him, let us go and fight him. Isaiah cursed Shebna. He would be disposed and he would eventually die in exile, he said. Another chief administrator, this time a faithful one, Eliakim by name, would be chosen in his place. When a man was appointed to such a high post, he would be dressed in a special white tunic with a sash around his waist. He would then be handed a large wooden key, which he carried on his shoulders to show that he has authority over everything the key could open. That means that he could open the main gate of the town. He had authority over the whole town, the gates of which were closed at the evening time and opened in the morning. And over the fortress in the middle, the garrison, where the garrison was stationed, stationed, that also could be opened by the key, meaning he was in charge of the garrison, the soldiers who were to guard. And then over the royal treasury, where money, gold, silver, precious things were kept. And these were kept in the strong, uh, the strong room adjacent to the temple, and this key could open it. Therefore, Eliakim had power over the, over the city, over the soldiers, and over the treasures. And therefore, he was second to the king. And the following words of Isaiah, Isaiah has meaning. What did he say? Should he open? 
no one shall close. Should he close, no one shall open. Should he open, no one shall close. And should he close, no one shall open. Isaiah gives another detail about Eliakim, the chief administrator. He compares him to the wooden or iron hooks which shepherds or soldiers drive into the ground and to which they tie the ropes they hold their tent in safety. If the packs are well fixed, the tent can withstand strong wind, even storm. The meaning of Isaiah is clear. Eliakim would bring safety to Jerusalem, the town which was being entrusted to his care. Apparently, the content of the first reading of today is nothing but in comparison, but the narration of the event that took place in Jerusalem 700 years ago before Jesus was born in comparison to the prophecy. The replacement of a chief administrator, Shebna, by another, Eliakim, stood for what would happen when the old covenant will be replaced by the new covenant. The old prophets would be replaced by God's own son, Jesus Christ. As it often happens in scripture, when God inspired Isaiah to write about that event, he had in mind the, what is being narrated in the gospel of today. Jesus knew the scriptures well. And in applying to Peter the words Isaiah had spoken about Eliakim, he clearly shows that God meant to explain the second event, event that we read about today in the gospel. Uh, it was for that purpose that Isaiah prophesied. Now let us come to the gospel. The so-called confession of Peter took place, as the gospel points out, towards the end of Jesus' life. In a town in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had already carried out his ministry for over two years. Now he took his close followers, the twelve, into a sort of a retreat to Caesarea Philippi, the north of Galilee. And there, there where Jesus was, there's a very beautiful spring. And on the rocky hill was a beautiful temple that Herod the Great had built in honor of the pagan god Pan Theon, the Pan, the pagan god Pan, and sacrifices being there were being offered. Many pagans, Gentiles, were coming there to that shrine dedicated to the pagan god Pan, built by Herod the Great. And it is in front of that, watching all this, that Jesus asked the twelve the question, what do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus was not interested actually in that answer. He was simply preparing the ground for the personal answer to the personal question, who do you say that Jesus is? I am. Uh, the, and who do you say I am? And Peter gave the reply in the name of all the apostles, you are the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. This was, this was a glorious moment for the apostles and for Jesus himself. After two years of careful training, the apostles have reached a very good con con conclusion. Jesus was both their God and their Savior, though they are still not sure about the first part, the Son of God, but certainly the Messiah, the chosen one God, the one in whom the Spirit of God rests, the Son of One, the Son of God, the Son of Man, who had come to save the world. And now Jesus congratulates Simon. Simon, son of Jonah, you are a happy man. It was not flesh and blood that revealed to you this, but my Father in heaven. That is, when we acknowledge Jesus as Lord, God, our Savior, it is not us who are arriving at that conclusion, or we arrive at that conclusion with the help of the Holy Spirit. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, without the help of the, human, uh, the Heavenly Father, we will never ever recognize as Jesus as our personal Savior, as our Lord and God. It took Jesus endless patience and care to bring his apostles to acknowledge him as their Savior. And God, 
has displayed a similar patience and love towards us as we grow in this personal acknowledgement. Yes, the Lord is my Lord. Is Jesus is my Lord and my God. He is my Savior. He is the one who has redeemed me from my sins. He is the one who leads me forward to that pasture that the Father has prepared for me. Now, Jesus tells Peter something very important for him, very precious. Now I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You are Peter. Jesus changes the name of Simon. He had already changed it when Simon went to see him for the first time. Andrew had brought him there. And he had already changed him, but now he sees the significance of that changing. You are Kepha, Kephas in Aramaic, or Petra in Greek, or Petrus in Latin, in English Peter. You, had, you are Peter, you are Petrus, you are Kepha, you are uh, Petra, meaning you are the rock. Nobody until then had used that term, Petra, Petrus, rock to call any person. Jesus uses it for the first time in human history to call Simon. You are Peter on this rock. I will build my church. There are few Aramaic terms that have come down to us because of the significance or their significance. One is the term Abba, Father. It is an Aramaic word. It is found in the scriptures because it's so significant, that word. The Christians refuse to forget the original word that Jesus uttered with his lips. Abba, Father. And uh, another term is Kepha. Kepha. Peter. Kepha. We don't forget that term. Jesus called him with affection, with love, with this responsibility. And Jesus knew that he was the cornerstone, but Peter and the rest of the apostles would make themselves the founder stone of this building. And in the, among the founder stones, the foundation stones, Peter is to be key. And uh, Jesus is a cornerstone. Now, there is, no corner, there is no contradiction between Jesus being the cornerstone and Peter being the foundation stone. You are rock along with the other apostles, the rock. Large buildings long ago started by placing a huge, well-chiseled and squared stone at the corner of the building. It was according to the size of that cornerstone that the rest of the foundation of the whole building proceeded in its length, breadth and uh, height. In the mind of Jesus, therefore, Peter was to be one with himself, that is with Christ, the foundation and the cornerstone of his church. As St. Paul tells very well to the Ephesians, he tells them, you are part of the building that he has the apostles and the prophets for his foundation, and Christ himself is the cornerstone. Peter and the apostles are connected to the cornerstone, Christ, and Peter was to guide the community in the name of Christ. He is the chief administrator, but not the honor of the church. The honor of the church is always Christ. The cornerstone of the church is always Christ. Peter, the apostles and their successors, namely the Pope and the bishops, have to build from what Peter and Christ, etc., have built the church. They have to hand over. Their power is not human power. The power of the apostles, it, has, it is divine power, power given to, to, by Christ, by God himself, to the apostles. Now we look at the first reading, Eliakim. And what Isaiah told Eliakim is so similar to what Jesus tells to Peter. Peter, the, it is so as though the word of Isaiah is being repeated in the mouth of Jesus. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Remember the keys Eliakim carried. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound on a, a heaven. 
What do you close, it will not be opened. What you will open, it will not be closed. Whatever you bind on earth shall be considered bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be considered loose in heaven. Peter was now given authority not to be a despot, not to be an authoritarian leader, but to be a father. To be a loving father, a caring father. Isaiah said, he shall be a father to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Regarding Eliakim, he shall be a father to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So, the successor of Peter and the apostles and their successors are our fathers. Our fathers, not authoritarian rulers who manipulate and control, but truly our fathers. That is why we call the Pope in Rome, Holy Father. And our bishops, our priests, fathers, they are our fathers, the great fathers of our faith. Now it is the Holy Spirit that gives Peter and his successes the light and the strength they need to guide to the church. Father, the Lord, the Heavenly Father led Peter to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of the world. And he would continue to assist the church, assist the Pope and the bishops to help us to proclaim Jesus as our Lord and God. But we know Peter was subject to human weakness. The night of the Passion, Peter denied Jesus thrice. He says, I don't know this man. Uh, and our Peters, the successors of Peter, that is our popes and the bishops, they are also weak. There are moments then they will fail in proclaiming Christ correctly, rightly. But the church will not fail because the church is still built on those apostles, their faith, that deposit of faith we know. It is in the scriptures. It is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It is in the perennial teachings of the Church and its practices. We know our faith. We know what. So when they teach, unfortunately, sometimes they may go wrong. We will immediately notice this is not the faith that is handed over to us. And the Lord will come to their aid and our aid to strengthen us in our weakness. At the Last Supper, Jesus gave Peter a further assurance. He said, I have prayed for you, Peter. And that is true. Jesus prays before the Father for our bishops, for our Pope, for our priests, that they remain faithful to whatever the truth of faith that they received and hand over that faith. And they may accompany God's people with affection, with love, with mercy, in a spirit of forgiveness. What was given to Peter was not for his own personal good, for his own gain, but for the good of the church. What the authority the church has, or the bishops have, the pope has, the priests have, they are for, for the sake of building the church. Now we know, in spite of Eliakim's faithfulness, Jerusalem was destroyed some years after his death. But this will not happen to the church. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Yes, the church can be hit very badly. Yes, in certain parts of the world, the church can disappear. But the one church of Christ that Jesus planted, Jesus established, Jesus founded, will continue to survive. Even if as a little flock in, the way, in various parts of the world, governed by Peter's successors, and the successes of other apostles. The second reading of today contains a hymn of praise to God given by St. Paul. St. Paul praises him for the wisdom and love he showed when he allowed the Jews to reject Jesus as a nation and so that the gospel may go to the Gentiles for a purpose. A day will come when the converted Gentiles, the Christians, will preach the gospel to the Jews one more time. And the Jewish nation will convert, and they will become part of the great community, the family of God. That is the power, the wisdom and the love that God has, and God has shown, and which will shine again when the Jews one day will accept Jesus, the good news, as their Lord and God, and indeed, Follow him, worship him. 
Therefore we must also make this hymn of wisdom, hope and joy our own hymn as we live in our communities, Christian communities, in our jumuyas, in our parishes. Let us not be discouraged with the problems, failures of our leaders. Let us not give up hope. Jesus' promise is there. I will be with you. Let us see everything as being the plan of plan of God. Even things that are not right according to what we know from the deposit of faith, it will all change. It will all change. It is all part of the plan of God. God knows how to write oh, straight with the crooked lines. God knows how to bring good out of evil. So let us persevere in the faith that is handed over to us, in the practices in the sacraments that the church, holy church has, which is still given to us, let us receive it with great joy, with great hope and love. And we join Jesus in our prayer that the Lord may pray for us as he prayed for Peter to assist us in our weakness and the weakness of our pastors and our leaders. And we pray, Father, give light and strength to those who guide the church in your name. Help us to confess Christ as our Savior and Lord through a faithful Christian life. He who lives and reigns with you, the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Dear God's family, a word about the Philatia missionaries. <clears throat> we work for young people, for families, following the spirituality of St. Francis de Sales and his teaching, as well as the teachings of Pope John Paul II, especially on family. If you are interested in joining us to becoming a sister, a nun, a brother, a priest, or work as a lay missionary, please contact us on the email philotheacenter at yahoo.com or on the phone numbers that are shown there, phone number 0722-798-710 or 0731-745-680. God bless you. Tum Sifiesa Christo.